so when we look at india's gdp right we are a consumption driven economy it's as simple as that now we are a country of close to 100 crore plus people we keep adding people every year and you know as the whole theme of uh, rural to urban migration happens uh, incomes of people rises they tend to uh, consume better products right and what that has done is this has kind of led to the whole fmcg sales growth so as you can see this graph the the sale of uh, fmcg products has kind of been in line with the gdp growth that has been going on now the obvious question that comes to mind is what now right so like the gdp growth uh, uh, the, the the gdp in terms of how it has kind of gone up uh, now this is uh, this is again the gdp number not the growth rate so obviously if kind of you were to put here uh, 2021 you'll see a slight blip here right and uh, we'll see how britannia has kind of fare against that right so just to give you some trailer into what is there towards the end of the presentation in q1 britannia did 114% pad growth and that was not just because they did a few book adjustments it was driven by operating profit margin growth and we'll try and analyze how has that happened right so this is to give you a context on how the fmcg landscape fits into the indian economic landscape right so if i talk about the fmcg industry in general it is a asset light industry so uh, like even though a lot of uh, companies which is including britannia have their own factories and they do their own production most of the products that are manufactured are outsourced so there are multiple contract manufacturers there are small small scattered players uh, what ha typically happens is a big fmcg guy walks up to the company says that look uh, you are already producing soap why not you know do these put these quality controls in place uh, get the product packed and sell it to another packer and what happens is that packer kind of packages it uh, with say the brand and the whole markup around that product and finally it goes to the stockist or the distributor right and whenever an industry is asset light it kind of opens up an entry barrier right so today if i go to a bank and if say i am successful in taking a 100 crore check from the bank i might just you know set up a biscuit factory right here but that's not the tough part the tough part is the distribution right and specifically in a product where your where your selling price points are 5 10 20 right uh, i mean the 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 smallest sku that britannia sells is 5 rupees uh, it could go to say their pure indulgence series or their nutri choice series at 60 70 80 price points but the smallest selling sku is at a price point of 5 so if you look at the whole distribution value chain so before the biscuit lands in your hand or the product lands in your hand it kind of goes to almost five touch points so from the factory it goes to a stockist the stockist sells it to a wholesale distributor the wholesale distributor sells it to a retail distributor and the retail distributor sells it to the retailer from where you end up buying so you can see at every level there are margin erosions happening so every at every level you have to leave a certain margin before that product lands up into your hands right so distribution is key and uh, and you also have to understand that when you look at a wholesale distributor or a retail distributor or for that matter a retailer right and we'll we'll uh, analyze the retailer landscape in detail in subsequent slides but the short point here is these guys are start for cash and they do not want to stock up on products that do not move right which kind of brings you back to the push versus the pull question so so if 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 we were to go back uh, a little in time specifically in the indian context if you remember a, a, a few years back uh, there were worms found out in cadbury chocolates and that led to a huge uh, trust erosion in the indian consumers mind and then you know cadbury did this whole rebranding exercise with mr amitabh bachchan saying that look uh, we have put more quality controls in place we've put additional packaging uh, mechanisms which kind of protects uh, the brand or protects the product so on and so forth and once that trust was established right so uh, as a country we still remain a very trust deficit society so once a trust is established or once a brand is built or it is etched in your head the relationship becomes irrational so today even if you are getting married even if it's a raksha bandhan or even if it's something uh, which has a moment of joy you you like and you know you have to have something sweet you kind of 
get in or lean on to a cadbury because that is the space cadbury uh, is uh, has in your in your mind right and so is the case with the tatas as well so the tatas are synonymous with trust you know once the the trust equation has been built so people will end up having salt they will end up buying tata cars so on and so forth so once a brand has a significant mind share in your uh, in in the indian consumer the relationship becomes irrational and uh, you know most of the companies in india spend a lot of money you know they burn their money through ads and uh, at the end of the day uh, you know having that trust or having that mind share requires a lot of effort and it requires a lot of time and once you've put in the effort and the time then uh, things kind of move in autopilot mode right so so imagine a wholesale distributor who has to move his money right so say if he's putting 100 rupees in stock he needs to get that 100 rupees back so that he can buy that 100 rupees worth of stock again so he would much rather have a product which has a pull rather than someone trying to push the product right so today uh, if you walk up to a store and if you want to have biscuits you would want to uh, probably go with say a britannia biscuit first and then say if the if the guy at the retail store says that look i may not have britannia right now then you would say okay give me a parley or give me an itc or so on and so forth and uh, that is how the whole uh, the whole pull occurs right so in terms of the push versus pull uh, in 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 the whole fmcg landscape pull plays a lot of role uh, rather than push and how do companies do push right so say if today uh, for example cadbury has launched oreo they've also launched bon vita biscuits so in order to in order for the brand to fly at first and compete against say a dark fantasy by itc or say a pure indulgence by britannia they have to leave money on the table so they would do that through say a few trade margin push they would give some incentives to the distributors to stock up on the products they would probably ensure better credit terms so maybe the distributor need not pay up front they can pay it in say the next 7 days or the 14 days and that kind of leaves you back with working capital management because uh it's a low margin business uh when it comes to say these guys not specifically the guy who's making so say britannia or a nestle uh and at the same time they have to move the product fast so both these things together along with the working capital management constraints it kind of uh it kind of makes it essential that the product should be in a pull mode rather than a push mode and when it comes to regulatory stability so the regulation or the inter- interference around this whole uh, fmcg space is fairly minimal right so regulation is standard since the industry has been around for 100 plus years we really don't see a lot of flip flop like say in the case of say a pharma industry or an aviation industry or a telecom industry so there is enough regulatory stability around and because of all these factors right asset light poor pull in the market regulatory stability high margin business most of the fmcg stocks in india are available at a very expensive uh, price to earning ratio and this is something which uh, which uh, which were raised in the q and a before we started this so a lot of these fmcg companies will never be available cheap unless any one of these factors is a miss so for example in case of say jyoti labs right jyoti labs has been in a space uh, for quite some time uh they do uh, fabric uh, fabric whiteners so on and so forth they also have contract with the railways and uh, again uh, whenever a government contract is forms a part of a uh, significant part of your customer profile your receivable days might just fall because collections are a little uh, collections happen a little on a longer credit period and that affects your working capital so that could be a miss uh say a new fmcg player entering so right now uh, tata for example tata consumer products is trying to organize the whole pulses space right so while they are doing that now since they already have a good track record of doing fmcg in the country with tea with salt you see them getting that multiple because they score on all these things right so that is the way uh, if you have to look at an fmcg company you have to individually look at these factors and see how it scores right now when i look at the retail landscape right uh, you have to understand that if i were to look at the whole retail landscape in the country i can broadly classify it between modern trade and general trade and what does this mean right so modern trade when i say modern trade think of a dmart think of a big bazaar think of a reliance fresh store 
And when I talk about general trade, think about the Kirana store or think about even the guy who comes to sell fruits to you in a cart, right? So that is how modern trade is differentiated with general trade. Uh, the other thing you have to understand is 90% of the retail in India is still unorganized. So this is something which a lot of folks have tried to crack again with without much avail. And this is something which I also covered in my latest post on Reliance as to where does the retail piece uh, go after the whole acquisition and the whole uh, deal value unlocking that happened. And that is something which Reliance is trying to do with Geomart. And not only that, we are seeing a lot of new uh, tech startups or a, a SaaS, which is a software as a service startups, trying to organize uh, commerce around this space, right? And uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, FMCG works more on pull and not on push, right? And, uh, and the whole game in FMCG or in uh, in products that are being sold, whether it is modern trade or whether it is general trade, it is a whole shelf space game. And what do I mean by that? Now think of a Kirana store which is right next to your house, say where you are buying regularly from, right? It's localized, It the guy who owns that store probably knows you, uh, you have good credit terms with him, products might be just, you know, coming into your house on regular intervals, so on and so forth. But what you have to understand is the space that he has within uh, the four walls that he operates in is very limited, right? So in a typical Kirana store, you would walk up and say that, look, give me Brook Bond tea or say, give me a Dove soap. You will not go and say, give me a soap or you will not go up and say, give me tea, right? You will always be specific with the brand that you ask for. And what that does it, uh, the guy who is at the store would want to stock up on products which are uh, which are always in vogue or which are always in demand, right? Because for him, if if it is not for that product, and if say there's there's a different product, so say today if I launch a new brand, so I launch a brand by the name of Saket and I want to sell biscuits, and say I go to the Kirana store and tell him that look, if Britannia is already giving you a margin of five percent, I'll give you a margin of ten percent. Why don't you stock up on my product? And after a month, and you know, I also say that instead of paying upfront you can pay me after 30 days. So that's the incentive that I've given to the retailer. Now, when I walk up to his store after the month and I ask him uh, that, you know, has sales happened or, uh, you know, give me my money, he would say, you please take your product back because I it is blocking my shelf space, right? And instead of you stocking up my product for 30 days, I would much rather play on a 0.5% margin and make my products move every three days, right? So that kind of gives him more comfort in uh, in operating. And similar is the case with modern trade as well. Now, when you look at a modern trade uh, outlet, so say, uh, think of a DMART, think of a Reliance Fresh, there are also a lot of new age brands want to occupy that shelf space. And a lot of times they pay uh, money apart from, say, uh, the product that the guy is stocking up on to just have shelf space. So the whole game is on shelf space. And what that does is, so these guys also have monthly reviews or quarterly reviews. And whenever they see that, you know, the, the bottom 20% of the products that are not moving enough, they would much rather want those products to be removed. Which is why you will also see a lot of these guys uh, are stacking up today on private label products. So they are pushing their own products. They are like, instead of uh, keeping products of other brands, why not take a push from our own products, right? And this is something which I borrowed uh, from one of HUL's presentation on e-commerce. So if you see, general trade is a is a big pie of how shoppers shop. Modern trade is a small pie. And within that modern trade, there is an even smaller pie, which is e-commerce, right? And how do you kind of optimize the product mix across these channels? So you basically have pack prices. So say if I'm selling biscuits through modern trade, I would want higher packs, packs which say are the mega super saver packs or bigger packs. And if I'm operating through a general trade, I would probably go with smaller packs. So that kind of helps me with incremental sales and it reduces the cannibalization, which is like say my product eating up into another product sales. So that is how the dynamics operate when we look at the retailer, right? Uh, now this is something so, uh, so I had come across this article yesterday. So Britannia, so this article came in, in Forbes and it, it is probably getting published next to next week in the in the physical magazine. So if you see, uh, so if you see uh, Britannia has kind of expanded its direct reach to retailers, right? So it was expanding at a healthy 
phase uh, because of COVID, it kind of fell down in March 20. And in June 20, it was back up much higher than the previous year's level, right? The other thing you have to understand is that uh, in urban India, there's only a limit to which you can penetrate markets. So the whole growth story lies in Bharat or in rural India. This is something which Nestle pursued as a strategy once the new CEO came in. And, you know, after before the Maggie ban, they were more focused on expanding margins, staying more towards the urban side, which is, again, there's nothing wrong with that strategy. But again, when the new CEO came in, the company went after volumes, they went into the rural hinterland, and that is how they started playing the volume game. And once you are into the volume game, then you can, you know, incrementally do your pricing, right? So whenever a company pivots to a volume game, that kind of puts him back on a growth phase. So today, uh, like there was a point of time when Britannia was doing close to 30% of volumes through through rural India. And today, uh, today they are doing uh, close to 37, 38% of their revenue from rural India, right? And if, even if you look at their number of rural preferred dealers, it is rising every year. Like just between March 20 to June 20, they've increased the rural distribution by about 3,000, right? And uh, jumping quickly into the e-commerce landscape and why it is important for us to cover. Now, this is again from the presentation, uh, from the slides of that HUL presentation I had borrowed. So today, if you see, there are a lot of these indie brands that have came up in e-commerce and it is largely fueled by private equity money chasing consumer uh, product groups, uh, CPGs, uh, consumer product brands. And a lot of these niche brands have come in. So think of, say, T-Box, think of uh, Skin Yoga. So something like a peel-off face mask or an or a, or a exquisite variety of tea. And they are operating on a DTC model, which is a direct-to-consumer model. What that means is I have a website, I am selling products through my website or I am selling it through Amazon and fulfilling it, right? So HUL kind of uh, uh, gave a word to this and they said that the whole business model is crap, which is can't realize any profit. And what do they mean by that? So as an indicative picture, they said that look, at 100 rupees MRP, you are making a 20% margin uh, and this margin is kind of going in your logistics cost. So the cost of fulfilling it and the cost of sending the product directly to your house, so on and so forth. And a 5% operation cost is what you are basically getting as your profit, which is a negative 5%. So again, this whole e-commerce shift, surely it's new. It's still at a very nascent stage. But the whole game here uh, is that no one has really made money till now. So it is more of a valuation game. So we've also seen some M&A interests happening. So I believe as uh, late as uh, early last quarter, Marico acquired Beardo. Now again, they want to look at new categories of growth. And once, you know, the, the bigger FMCG guys have a brand with them, they might just be able to play it better. But that's the whole game that these players are in, right? So that kind of covers what uh, this new age models look like. So the reason for covering e-commerce again was uh, because of this whole COVID scenario, modern trade has been affected. Right. And what this has led to is the whole e-commerce boom has happened. So even like, you know, credit card spends today, the highest, which earlier used to be on travel is right now happening on groceries. So it is also important to understand how the dynamics of this industry is shaping up.